We read everywhere that in 5 billion years, the sun will end its life cycle, expanding to become a red giant that will swallow our planet. The 5 billion years is also understood, therefore, as the time that remains to live on Earth. But in reality, the Earth as a planet capable of hosting life will end to exist much earlier. Not tomorrow, of course, and not even in a year or a century. According to the results of new research, in fact, our atmosphere will maintain the current amount of oxygen only for another billion years. Will this be true? And even if it is, what implications might this discovery have for us? Let's try to find out by first doing a brief summary of the evolution of the Earth's atmosphere from its origins to the present day. The end of the world? It will come much sooner than they have always told us. The air we breathe, and that together with us breathes almost all the creatures living on Earth, is a gaseous mixture without equal in the solar system. Aside from water vapor, which can be found in widely varying amounts, air is made up of nitrogen 78%, oxygen 21%, and carbon dioxide 0.03%, with other gases present only in trace amounts. Luckily for us, the current atmospheric composition has remained practically unchanged for at least 500 million years. But it is good to know that an oxygen concentration higher than 35% would make our planet burn by auto combustion, while a concentration lower than 13% would make life impossible for most of the current living beings. It would then come to think, how lucky are we to be born on a planet with an atmosphere with a composition so favorable to our needs? Well, first of all, we need to be aware of the fact that the atmosphere that is currently allowing our planet to support life has not always been as we know it today. And not only that, we know for a fact that the Earth's atmosphere has even been characterized by four different types of atmosphere throughout the course of its history. In the beginning, just after the formation of the Earth, it was in fact very different, rich in gases that would have been highly toxic to current life forms. The most abundant element in the primordial atmosphere was hydrogen and several of its compounds such as ammonia and methane. These were the ingredients of the old solar system and protoplanets from which the Earth originated. However, the temperature of our planet was very high, which gave these compounds among the lightest from the point of view of molecular weight an average speed of each of their molecules very close to the escape velocity of the planet. And when the average velocity of the molecules of gas equals or exceeds the so-called escape velocity of a planet, which is the initial velocity required for any object launched from the surface to escape its gravitational field, then that gas tends to disperse forever into outer space. And it is for this reason that our atmosphere is now virtually devoid of hydrogen, light and fast element par excellence. The primordial atmosphere was then replaced by a second atmosphere, composed mainly by water vapor and carbon dioxide. These gases were emitted in large quantities by volcanic eruptions, a phenomenon much more frequent on Earth at that time than it is in our era, given the vigorous geological activity of the young planet. The enormous quantities of water vapor emitted led to the unleashing of rains that lasted for millennia, and that had two main effects. Decisive for the subsequent evolution of biotic forms, they lowered the surface temperature and formed the oceans. The atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide underwent a drastic reduction because it was largely absorbed by the waters of the oceans, a process that has vital importance for the biosphere even today. Some of the carbon dioxide was removed through chemical reactions that led to the formation of carbonates in rock sedimentation. But enough carbon dioxide remained in the atmosphere, about 300 times more than now, to create a greenhouse effect so intense that the oceans did not freeze. The consequence was that the Earth was much warmer than it is now and the polar ice caps did not appear until 2.5 billion years ago. Hang on before we continue. Don't forget to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell. You will help us to make products of even higher quality. The third type of atmosphere was formed about 2 to 3 billion years ago, when life was already beginning to spread and differentiate, with a massive presence of carbon dioxide and still very little oxygen. In the meantime, nitrogen, due to its poor chemical reactivity, had retained its initial, albeit modest, concentration. But as a result of the drastic reduction of water vapor and carbon dioxide, it became the main component of the atmosphere, 78%, a position it retains to this day. 
Then the fourth and final change occurred. Oxygen atoms combined to create an ozone layer that began to absorb most of the UV rays, which are known to be harmful to life. So much so that it was only after the formation of the ozonosphere that the first forms of plant life appeared on Earth in the form of green algae. But as known, plants in the process of photosynthesis consume carbon dioxide and emit oxygen, so that over millions of years the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere increased progressively until it reached the current levels, 21%, already about 600 million years ago. Basically, we can say that all the oxygen currently present in the atmosphere has been produced over hundreds of millions of years by photosynthetic organisms, mainly bacteria. It is curious to note that oxygen today, essential to most of the existing organisms, represented at the time a real problem for primordial organisms. The increase in the concentration of gas so poisonous and aggressive could have caused the extinction of most of the life forms that then populated the waters, if there were no microorganisms capable of using it to obtain greater amounts of energy from organic substances that they themselves produced. Over the course of millions of years, photosynthesis and respiration determine the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide that still allows life to thrive on Earth today. Since then, the composition of our atmosphere does not seem to have changed much, but to disturb the sleep of those who thought it could last forever, here comes the news already anticipated at the beginning. Scientists all agree that life cannot go on forever on planet Earth. Eventually, the sun will run out of energy and destroy itself. Life forms will likely find it increasingly difficult to survive prior to that, though, as the sun grows hotter. In this new effort, the researchers sought to find the tipping point for life, when the planet will no longer be able to support most plants and animals. To find that tipping point, the researchers created a simulation of Earth that factored in variables that describe the climate as well as geological and biological processes, and most importantly, the activity of the sun. The researchers then ran their simulations to see how the Earth fared far into the future. The simulation showed that as the sun grew hotter, one billion years from now, releasing more energy, carbon dioxide levels in Earth's atmosphere will begin to drop due to the gas absorbing the heat and breaking down. The ozone layer would also be burned away. Then as carbon dioxide levels fall, plant life will begin to suffer, resulting in reduced production of oxygen. Over a period of just 10,000 years, carbon dioxide levels will drop so much that plant life would go extinct. Without plant life, land and sea dwelling creatures would soon go extinct, as well due to the lack of a breathable atmosphere. Meanwhile, the simulation also showed increasing levels of methane entering the atmosphere, speeding the demise of creatures needing oxygen to breathe. The result, according to the simulation, would be a planet without life, save for tiny anaerobic creatures such as bacteria, conditions very similar to Earth prior to the evolution of plants and animals. The rate of weathering of silicate minerals will increase as rising temperatures speed up chemical processes. This in turn will decrease the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as reactions with silicate minerals convert carbon dioxide gas into solid carbonates. Within the next 600 million years from the present, the concentration of carbon dioxide will fall below the critical threshold needed to sustain photosynthesis, about 50 parts per million. At this point, trees and forests in their current forms will no longer be able to survive, the last living trees being evergreen conifers. This decline in plant life is likely to be a long-term decline rather than a sharp drop. That plant group will likely die one by one well before the 50 parts per million level are reached. The first plants to disappear will be herbaceous plants, followed by deciduous forests, evergreen broadleaf forests, and finally evergreen conifers. However, carbon fixation can continue at much lower concentrations, down to above 10 parts per million. Thus, plants using photosynthesis may be able to survive for at least 0.8 billion years, and possibly as long as 1.2 billion years from now, after which rising temperatures will make the biosphere unsustainable. The first animals to disappear would be large mammals, followed by small mammals, birds, amphibians and large fish, reptiles and small fish, and finally, invertebrates. Before this happens, it's expected that life would concentrate at refugia of lower temperature, such as high elevations where less land surface area is available, thus restricting population sizes. Smaller animals would survive better than larger ones because of lesser oxygen requirements, while birds would fare better than mammals thanks to their ability to travel large distances looking for colder temperatures. 
based on oxygen half-life in the atmosphere, animal life would last at most 100 million years after the loss of higher plants. However, animal life may last much longer since more than 50% of oxygen is currently produced by phytoplankton. Very sad, but I bet some of you are already thinking, where the hell is the problem? In a billion years, our species may already be extinct for who knows how long. And in that, you would be right. Maybe we will already be recycled dust and atoms in other stars. Or will we have made so much progress that we can easily solve even the problem of the sun's heat gain? Or maybe we will have already migrated to planets and other stars. So why bother? Well, the main concern is scientific. Imagine we were aliens on another world scanning the heavens for signs of life by looking for oxygen and ozone in the atmospheres of exoplanets. If our instruments passed over Earth 2 billion years from now, or 2 billion years ago, we might interpret a false negative, that such planets lacked a reliable biosignature and move on with our search. The same problem faces astronomers and planetary scientists today. What kind of exoplanets should we target? And what is a reliable biosignature of alien life? Habitability is not just a place around the star, but a time in a planet's evolution, and we must remain aware that we are limited to what we can see right now. The future of our atmosphere bears a strong resemblance to its distant past, low in oxygen, rich in methane, if not carbon dioxide, with the possibility of organic hazes. As the authors of the new study suggest, using Earth as an analog, we might need to think more broadly about which gases to look for in exoplanet atmospheres, and that we may need to rethink our interpretations of what those gases may indicate. We need to better understand the history of our own atmosphere's evolution over time. Only then will we be better placed to determine whether there is life living in the glare of other suns. I think this is the only lesson that this news is able to give us at the moment. What do you think about it?